So yeah, welcome to my talk. My name is Raphael. I actually studied here at HSR uh, in electronic engineering. And I work at Sensirion since four years and extensively using Python since like two years ago. Um, first, I will show you a few examples uh, really fast because I have a lot of examples and not so much time. Then I show you some pains we had when Python usage was like exp uh, exploding at Sensirion. And then I show you some of our solutions that hopefully work. So first, uh, how do we use Python? For that, I just need to give you a really, really short introduction to what Sensirion actually does. So basically, we um, design custom ASIC, this electronics, um, let them pr produce externally in a standard process like every electronic is manufactured today. This gets delivered to us as wafers, so sort of these shiny silicon things. And then we apply a lot of magic. This is actually where the real thing happens. We are testing the stuff, cutting the, the wafer into the individual, individual sensors, adding our sensor elements to it, and do lots of magic stuff, and calibrate the thing. So in the end product, you get a tiny little sensor, which is fully calibrated, integrated, and you can talk with uh, I2C or whatever SPI, depending on what product you order. So. Yeah, of course, we, we make them tinier and faster and stuff, or make them more robust, like the, the thing you see on the right. It's for automotive, so a little bit more stable. Yeah, so um, you, I guess you figured it. We produce hardware, not software. So, um, but we use a lot of software to manage the production of the hardware. The most production-critical software is actually written in C Sharp. But then for the R&D purposes, we use almost only Python. And this is mostly written by non-software engineers, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will show you what that means. <laughs> um, this is kind of like a, a really short um, and horribly simplified life cycle of when we develop a new sensor. I mean, there's some early experimentation, then uh, you have some prototype, you order the first silicon, you get the first wafer, you need to qualify, test it, maybe you arrive at... Uh, uh, the, the first production ready thing, and then you have the final product. It's horribly simplified and it's overlapping and stuff, but yeah, you get the picture. So um, during the step one to four, we actually do nothing in C Sharp, but all in, in the lab with mostly Python. So uh, I'll show you a few examples. Uh, one example is data analysis. We, um, can, you can do data analysis with Excel or with MATLAB or whatever, but we're trying to standardize to using Pandas, this uh, data, uh, data analysis library for Python. And you use it for data processing, use JupyterPython notebooks to work interactively, use PyQt or PySide, which is just Python binding security, to create GUIs for if you have recurring analysis that you need to do. And yeah, this mostly works on um, two types of data. It's um, one which is for the whole wafer and data which is from experiments with individual sensors. I will focus on the wafer data for this example. So um, if you analyze a wafer, you get data from many, many inputs. You have something, the, the supplier of the wafer gives you data in different formats like Excel files, uh, comma-separated values or some JSON data or whatever. And we also have our internal data, which is mostly stored in SQL database. And those formats change over time. So even if you have like the same supplier, um, one day he sends you this file, the next day he sends you another file, or you requested some specific measurement, and yeah. So the first thing we do is we store it in standardized CSV, CSV formats and store it at a specific place. So this is a lot of dirty, quickly evolving Python scripts because you want to get access to the new data as fast as possible. So the, but this enables us to like, separate the ugly code from the, the nice code. And now I show you the nice code. This is actually an uh, analysis uh, user interface where you can select um, like which wafer you want to analyze, um, some parameters. I don't really know what this stuff means because I don't work there, but um, you can create nicely looking plots. So um, you have the plot in the middle. It's interesting as you see the, your wafer. And you, you see it seems to have some property which is specific to the position on the wafer. And in the plot on the right, you see uh, like you have two measurements and how they correlate to each other. So uh, uh, here's another picture where you see the, uh, a measurement in the wafer in a lot more detail. 
And yeah, often you have the problems when you have a problem with a machine. It's uh, we test always like 32 devices at the same time on the wafer, and then you get patterns in this in your measurement results with, where you have the errors always in the same in the same spot. So yeah, so the, the conclusion, Pondos and PySight are very powerful tools for doing data analysis. And it's important that you standardize your input data so you can reuse much of your plotting and analysis code to um, get access to your data. And if you standardize how you present the data, everybody can just look, or almost everybody can just look at the plots and understand them because they know how they were created. So um, another example is where we um, had problem on, on certain hardware. We had problem with noise, electric noise. And on the left, you see um, yellow is the signal, and the pink one is uh, like the FFT of the signal. And uh, the left one is a good uh, example, and the right one is a, is a bad one. So we needed to find where this is, and this was on a production machine, so we had to do it quick so we can continue the production. Uh, so we recorded the noise with uh, automa more or less automatic, and then wrote some ugly code, like you see here. I just go through it, so it's just um, like kind of throw away code, because what we really wanted is this one. So here you see um, on the x-axis there are the which channel of the 32 we connect simultaneously. And you see the noise is very specific to um, like channel 11, 13. There's some pattern in there. And actually, we measured this everything Took the, um, took the machine o offline for this to measure that, then could analyze the data out, uh, outside of the production, and this was really awesome. Then we could find the issue in the layout, some sensor, but some other connected device was um, giving us a lot of noise. On the bottom half you see um, without the, the noise without this sensor connected, so it really fixed the problem. Yeah. Um, we could fix the problem by changing the hardware, and this measure and analyze offline approach saves a lot of time. So we could just measure everything and analyze it offline where we had time and could figure out where the problem really, really was. So another example is um, automated testing. Um, a lot of time we have, you have a, like a prototype of 10 pieces and you need to test them all. But this is like, um, it's not the final product, so you have an ad hoc setup that maybe looks like this. They just have a, like a power supply on the left, your main electronics in the middle, and some measurement instruments. And you really just want to measure a few, a few samples. And now it's tempting to do this manually. I mean, it's only five boards, it's just, it, doesn't scale if I automate it, it's, I just do it by hand. But as a software engineer, and you were probably lots of software engineers, you know tests should be automated. And I have actually the same slide as the one with one told before. Uh, automate all the tests, yeah. And the cool thing is lots of this lab equipment can be um, automated. It's either if it's a little bit old, it has an Aros 232, um, connection, there's a UART or USB, or what's uh, an interesting standard that is upcoming is LXI. It's over Ethernet, and if you're lucky, it supports the IVI API, which is a standardization across um, different suppliers of lab equipment. And if you're really, really lucky, then it's supported by the Python IV package. And if it's not supported, just look for a device with a similar name and try it. It may work. I mean, you may need to tweak some timeouts and settings, but uh, it, it, mostly it works. So, um, yeah, so just automate the whole test and put it in a JupyTor no notebook. This will then maybe look like, like that. So on the left, you see like, uh, some code to get input from your um, lab measurement tools. So these plots are like, directly from the, you gather them from the tools via, via Ethernet. And then you can do some processing and uh, add further analysis and plotting, and can actually end up with a very nice looking report which um, satisfies your manager's need or whatever. <laughs> this is kind of a, <laughs> a co worker of mine did this. Um, he tried to put it on the top and just automate it completely. So just have to press one button, the whole test runs through, and you get this nice looking PDF how the device worked or not. And then. Um, <laughs> 
This leads to reproducible measurements, and it scales also for the next 10 prototypes you need to test, because almost always you find some error, you need to fix it and order 10 more of these devices and test again. And also you can store the test description, the instruction, together with the code, and you can also give it to a non-trained engineer. Just um, use this notebook, press this button, follow the instructions, and you can uh, basically let an apprentice or some unskilled person do the test. And you don't have to fiddle with the settings of your measurement instruments, which can be a pain. Yeah, so um, another use case is um, we don't just produce um, our sensors, we also produce uh, little modules. You can, this is the Smart Gadget development kit. You can get one there over, over there at the, the booth. Um, yeah, mostly it consists of a low power microcontroller some of our sensors, hopefully, uh, and some other peripheral. So we use it for, to do further calculations with the sensor values and compensation for self-heating or whatever, and to support additional uh, protocols like Bluetooth, in this case, or just to have something you can show off to a customer, because just a little tiny sensor you see here. Um, it, it's a bit boring, just for itself. So yeah, um, mostly you have some reference signal processing implemented in Python or whatever, which was developed by some R&D engineer in the lab, and now you need to port it to the embedded system using C, C++. You don't have a floating point unit, you have very low RAM. Um, you could use MicroPython probably, but um, yeah, but most of the time you just work in C because it should be low power. Um, and now we need to verify that it still works the same. So. Um, Last year, there was the great talk from Armin Rigo about CFFI. This really helped us uh, because we now use it. And yeah, we have a little hack I want to show is uh, how to just get uh, it uh, with low overhead, getting started with CFFI. It's just to um, make a, an all includes um, header file which contains the whole public API of your embedded code that you need to test, then uh, squash it together with GCC by pre-processing everything and output this in a text file and then use CFFI to just parse this text file. This works mostly well. Then you need to compile the, the, the library, of course, and then you just can call the C code from CFFI. So yeah, then you can do all your analysis in Python. This is some um, random data plotted with Python, but it could be your embedded algorithm that you're testing and verifying if it still works correctly. So, whoops. So let's go a step further. Um, yeah, Python usage was, was growing in, at Sensirion because um, in, the, in the beginning it was very easy. It was 2008 around, um, and we decided to, um, or they decided, it wasn't part of the company at that time, uh, to just use Python, uh, Python XY, which is a Python distribution for Windows um, in the version 2.6 and install it on every machine that wants to use Python, and it comes pre-installed with libraries, so every script runs on every machine, everybody's happy, and you don't need to care about dependencies because everything is there in the distribution. So, yeah, it ran really well until it, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the problem is this distribution ships with a whole lot of libraries for the same, sometimes for the same purpose. Some of these libraries are of rather low quality, and if you have the different groups or people using different libraries, the, the exchange of code uh, gets difficult. So, and also Python 2.6 started to get outdated. I mean, this, like, uh, jump forward four years, there was, like, Python 3.5 and Python 2.7. Yeah, so individuals also required newer versions of libraries, like the newer Pandas version, which fixed a lot of bugs, and some special package um, only provided wheels for Python 2.7 and not 2.6. So, parts of Sensirion upgraded to Python 2.7. The others didn't. So this led to um, all of a sudden, all the, um, the benefits of having the same base installation were gone. So you had um, like your code was only running in, in, inside your group or on your computer, and it was pretty mess. Also, it led to like um, custom Python installation scripts for every group. So you had um, this funny. Um, Set up instructions 
like um, check out these S fine directories at this magic place, um, copy the folder from there and set the Python path to this place, uh, copy some .NET DLLs to this path, edit this config, add these values. This was different in, uh, depending on the department where you worked. And it was just a collection of piles and piles and hack to get your base installation up to date. And yeah, it was rather painful. And then, um, since we have this base installation, no dependency management, we, some people started to use S4N as a packaging and distribution system. So you ended up with things like that, that you had to check out the whole S4N repository with all tags and the trunk. And then you did funny thing on import time. You imported a specific tag, the specific version of this thing. It worked surprisingly good when I first, when somebody showed me this, this doesn't work at all. It really works pretty well for us, actually. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I was shocked. <laughs> and it's, of course, a bit of a maintenance hell because you have to check out the whole uh, repository on every machine. You have to take care of that in tags. You only import from other tags. And from trunk, you're allowed to import whatever you like. And yeah. Then some other pain point was um, Python.net. It's a really awesome tool. It allows you to call into any existing .NET code. And we have really a lot of C Sharp .NET code, which is used in production. It's high, of high quality. And you can use all this power from Python, except it's not so awesome if those .NET libraries have interdependencies. And um, you have this Python module, which um, Uses some Python, uh, use, use some .NET libraries, ships with them. You check it out via SVN and you check out all the DLLs. Um, and then you have this other module which uses another version of the same DLL, and you have the classic diamond dependency hell. And this leads to random behavior at um, runtime. So um, yeah, you. The import order is suddenly important. Which library gets loaded first? So that you have the newer version uh, and stuff like that it was. Really pain in the ass. Uh, really a lot of pain to uh, debug this. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, another thing was um, this heavily reuse of production code led to some massive, massive over-engineering. Uh, this is an example of a, it's an in-house developed um, test platform called Pilatus. The, the one before was called Riki. It's just two mountains in Switzerland. And they're used both in production and in the R&D labs. And we have to talk to this thing. This is an embedded system. Um, we use an RPC framework. This is just you can call functions over the network. So it's connected via TCP IP or Ethernet. Um, and you just can call functions over the network. And we use a, little, a middleware called Zero C, IS, um, which where you can define interfaces. And then it generates go code for C Sharp or C++ or whatever you like. And of course, there was lots of C Sharp code around, which was used in production, where this machine was used. And then, yeah, let's use all this awesome code. Uh, I mean, it's existing. We should use it in the lab. So just put some Python on it. So we have this awesome C Sharp framework, and then we put an awesome Python wrapper. We source very Pythonic on it, and then you can write awesome Python applications on it. So until you need to change something in the firmware, and it needs to propagate all the way to stack up, so you change some, add a new feature in the firmware on the embedded device. Then you need to update the C Sharp framework, you need to update the Python wrapper, and then you can update your application. And a week is gone, and three people were busy. And actually, in the lab, you need low level access because you want to um, have low level access. 10 minutes, OK. So I call this uh, like lasagna code. Uh, this is what lasagna looks like it's too many layers. I'm Italian, so it's OK. <laughs> Um, yeah, the solution is we have already have this network middleware which can generate bindings for different um, language. So we just generate the Python bindings for it and use it directly. So we have no interference with other .NET uh, using li uh, libraries which were written in Python. And we have immediate access to every functionality which gets implemented in the firmware. And it's as low level as you want. So yeah, the lessons learned, don't use a big, uh, big Python distribution which ships piles and piles of libraries but standardize your base install and keep it up to date so the users will actually use it and not just um, update by themselves. And if something is simple to implement in pure Python, do it. And if you want to have reusable code, build a proper Python package. So now, how do we try to achieve this? 
This is actually an ongoing process. Um, first, we set up a Python user group called POG, with um, experienced experience Python users from every group at Sensirion. And since it's called a POG, we have a nice little mascot. And yeah, it's basically used to collect um, use cases, to collect um, knowledge and everything else. So, um, and also, we provide infrastructure for the others to use, we coordinate the updates of the base installation, and we, we, yeah, we collect the requirements and try to implement reusable packages for every group to use. So um, for that, we need some packaging infrastructure. We use um, DevPy, this self-editorized as PyPy server and packaging testing release tool. And what's super amazing about this, that it can mirror the whole of PyPy.org. So every time you fetch a package which was never fetched, it just downloads it from PyPy.org, and if you request it at the same time, it gets served from the, your local network, which is way faster. And then we set up uh, like some staging and stable index per group, where you just can upload your own package. And there are some um, packages which, which are really difficult to compile, especially on Windows. There's uh, NumPy, SciPy, and you can compile them with optimizations for your CPUs and everything to gain performance. And we provide our own wheels for this um, hard to compile packages. The index looks a bit like this. Um, the main thing is we have the Sincerion stable index, which just pulls packages from every group's stable repository and from the PyPy server. And every group has their staging area where they can update and test their own packages and test it and push them to stable when they're ready. So um, this also needs some CI. So we are currently setting up GitLab. It's still in the evaluation phase, but um, the Python users are already using it for, for everything. So where you can, um, Every change in the code gets built, gets packaged for Windows and Linux, and gets deployed to staging directly. And if you, um, like manually, you can then deploy it to stable. This works pretty awesome for us. So and the whole other thing is standardization. Uh, lots of engineers use uh, comma-separated value formats for data storage. So we created our own um, internal standard for this kind of um, data, and it's basically just CSV, uh, CSV with metadata, standardized metadata. And the uh, awesome thing about EDF files is you can just double click it and open it in Excel and it shows up. This was a really important feature. And yeah, you can see uh, some small examples. You have just uh, the version, which is a must have, the date, and it's strongly typed, which is important when parsing the CSV files. So you know what column has which type. This improves performance and stability if um, pandas can't recognize what type it should be. So yeah, we store these EDF files in a um, standardized storage place and index them with Solar. Solar is some kind of search engine. It's uh, the Google uh, for, for your home or something. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we provide modules to save uh, um, data in this backend called lab data. Uh, have the EDF crawler from Solar, which searches the metadata and indexes the metadata. Then if you want to retrieve data, you can just search through this index and retrieve the, the data files. We'll quickly show you how this works. So you have this data access module, and you can search for keywords like dummy, file type, and training, and then you receive the files which match this metadata. And then you can, if you um, search for specific measurement, you can search for a sensor ID, and this, in this example, it's training dummy. Say so you want every data starting from this date, and then just pick the three newest items, and yeah, you get the, you get the data directly. So this really eases um, the five minutes, the retrieval of data you've stored. So I'm basically finished. Um, yeah, Python is really awesome for automated testing in the lab data analysis and creating wonderfully beautiful plots. And it's important to, to establish a common base of packages around your company, but you should keep it up to date. And yeah, use proper Python packages for reusable code, because if you have like quality issues and you need to um, redo an old measurement, you want to be able to actually restore in a virtual end for something, um, an old state of your libraries where you can do the same measurement. 
And it's also important to standardize your data format so that you can easily ch change your data. So that's it. Thank you very much. All right, thanks a lot. Do we have any questions? Over there? Uh, how did you convince the management and IT team to uh, support this, this idea? I mean, you need a server, you need all the infrastructure to support this. Um, a, a, lot of, a lot of it is basically just do it. Because, <laughs> no, uh, it's, um, I'm not actually sure. I mean, we had to do quite some lobbying to also could, uh, that we could make this Python user group that we get paid time to actually create a group and get everybody together once in a while. And yeah, it, it took some convincing, but I mean, I, I measure success in um, like support requests per week. And I try to keep this uh, number low and uh, it gets lower since we started the Python user group. So I get less complaints about not working Python code. And I mean, this really pays off. We, and these benefits, you can, clear, you can not really measure them, but you can communicate them. And it's convincing, yeah. Another question? I just had a very technical question, which is, you mentioned that you were building your own wheels for some of the packages. Yes. And I have the feeling that things have improved like vastly over the few years uh, in, this, in this direction. It used to be really nasty. So can you comment on what specific challenges you're facing that pushed you to build your own wheels? Um, um, mostly if you just do pip install, um, from Windows, it tries to compile some packages sometimes. Not, not mostly it, there are provided wheels for in the pypy.org, um, but also um, we enable lots of optimizations for modern CPUs, and the packages pypy.org uh, do not enable these optimizations. And now if you have one package which has enabled the optimizations and the other one didn't, then they don't play well together. So we need to provide it for scipy, numpy, and but are you sure that this is still true? I mean, that was true for years ago, but... Uh, Maybe we need to check again, so I'm, I'm not really I'd sure. I'd be interested. No. We just had this problem and solved it, and well, we stuck to this. Uh, well, maybe we should reevaluate. It would ease a lot of uh, stuff. Uh, yes. <laughs> Do we have more questions over there? Um, there's a question uh, regarding this uh, C++ Python interfacing. Um, could you comment on uh, using eyes? Uh, what was the question again? Uh, I have seen on one of your slides that you use for Python C++ interfacing eyes. Uh, it's, it, it's not actually um, the interface to C++, but it's um, the firmware, which um, is an embedded system, which uh, just runs a server, which provides an RPC um, interface. So lots of the testing code runs in the embedded system. And yeah, so you just call it from, from um, via this ICE RPC framework from outside over the network. Is this answer enough? Any other questions? It's over there. Um, I was wondering, you talked about how you standardize the packages that the people are using. Have you also done anything um, for the interpreter itself so that this gets deployed automatically or something that you use a standard installation? Uh, yes, we have a standard insula installation which is based on WinPython, um, which is just uh, like some portable version of, um, of Python and we we have this uh, software deployment system for um, software on Microsoft Windows, which we use to distribute this uh, WinPython installation. So we could theoretically push updates to all 
but uh, we don't do that. It's just uh, you have to manually update, actually. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, not Python related question, hardware related. Uh, you mentioned that you're printing chips, and is it done by Serion or outsourced? What? Uh, <laughs> printing on the wafers, is it done inside the company or is it outsourced? Uh, the, the, the production of the wafer itself? Yeah. Uh, the production of the wafer itself is um, done somewhere in Taiwan. No, I, I mean, think, or... not the wafer, printing on it, like lithography. Ah, um, we do a lot of um, wafer processing in Switzerland in Stefa, yeah. Okay. I don't so, know but the exact... by this company? Like, what? By, by the company? By Centurion, yes. And what lithography machine do you use? I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> I, I think they, they, they give them actually cute names, and one is called Bircha. That's all I know. <laughs> Thank you. I guess we have time for one more question. No? All right, let's thank Raphael. Thank you.